Mr. McCoy here with the eleventh part of the borrowers. Wait a minute, pleaded the boy. Again, he reached behind him. Again, the hand came down, and there, beside the dresser, where there was barely room for it, was a very small doll's chair. It was a Victorian chair, upholstered in red velvet. Oh, Arietti exclaimed again, and Pod said shyly, just about fit me, that would. Try it, begged the boy, and Pod threw him a nervous glance. Go on, said Arietti, and Pod sat down in his nightshirt, his bare feet showing. That's nice, he said after a moment. It would go by the fire in the sitting room, said Arietti. It would look lovely on red blotting paper. Let's try it, said the boy, and the hand came down again. Pod sprang up just in time to steady the dresser as the red velvet chair was whisked away above his head and placed, presumably, into the next room. Arietti ran out of the door and along the passage to see. Oh, she called out to her parents, come and see, it's lovely. But Pod and Homily did not move. The boy was leaning over them, breathing hard, and they could see the middle buttons of his nightshirt. He seemed to be examining the farther room. What do you keep in that mustard pot? he asked. Coal, said Arietti's voice, and I helped to borrow this new carpet. Here's the watch I told you about and the pictures. I could get you some better stamps than those, the boy said. I've got some Jubilee ones with the Taj Mahal. Look, cried Arietti's voice again, and Pod took Homily's hand. These are my books. Homily clutched Pod as the great hand came down once more in the direction of Arietti. Quiet, he whispered. Sit still. The boy, it seemed, was touching the books. What are they called? he asked, and Arietti reeled off the names. Pod, whispered Homily. I'm going to scream. No, whispered Pod. You mustn't. Not again. I feel it coming, said Homily. Pod looked worried. Hold your breath, he said, and count ten. The boy was saying to Arietti, Why couldn't you read me those? Well, I could, said Arietti, but I'd rather read something new. But you never come, complained the boy. I know, said Arietti, but I will. Did you hear that? Did you hear what she said? Yes, yes, Pod whispered. Keep quiet. Do you want to see the storerooms? Arietti suggested next, and Homily clapped a hand to her mouth as though to stifle a cry. Pod looked up at the boy. Hey, he called, trying to attract his attention. The boy looked down. Put the roof back now, Pod begged him, trying to sound matter-of-fact and reasonable. We're getting cold. All right, agreed the boy, but he seemed to hesitate. He reached across them for the piece of board which formed their roof. Shall I nail it down? He asked, and they saw him pick up the hammer. It swayed above them, very dangerous looking. Of course nail us down, said Pod irritably. I mean, said the boy, I've got some more things upstairs. Pod looked uncertain and homily nudged him. Ask him, she whispered. What kind of things? What kind of things? asked Pod. Things from an old doll's house there is on the top shelf of the cupboard by the fireplace in the schoolroom. I've never seen no doll's house, said Pod. Well, it's in the cupboard, said the boy, right up by the ceiling. You can't see it. You've got to climb on the lower shelves to get at it. What sort of things are there in the doll's house? asked Arietti from the sitting room. Oh, everything, the boy told her. Carpets and rugs and beds with mattresses, and there's a bird in a cage, not a real one, of course, and cooking pans and tables and five gilt chairs and a pot with a palm in it, a dish of plaster tarts and an imitation leg of mutton. Homily leaned across to Pod. Tell him, to na- tell him to nail it down lightly, she whispered. Pod stared at her, and she nodded vigorously, clasping her hands. Pod turned to the boy. All right, he said. You nail us down, but lightly, if you see what I mean. 
just a tap or two here and there. Well, the fact that the boy has discovered where Pod, Homily, and Arietti live has good things about it and bad things about it. What are some good things and what are some bad things? Share with your fellow listener. Then began a curious phase in their lives. Borrowings beyond all dreams of borrowing. A golden age. Every night the floor was opened and treasures would appear. A real carpet for the sitting room, a tiny coal scuttle, a stiff little sofa with damask cushions, a double bed with a round bolster, a single ditto with a striped mattress, framed pictures instead of stamps, a kitchen stove which didn't work but which looked lovely in the kitchen. There were oval tables and square tables and a little desk with one drawer. There were two maple wardrobes, one with a looking glass, and a bureau with curved legs. Homily grew not only accustomed to the roof coming off, but even went so far as to suggest to Pop that he put the board on hinges. It's just the hammering I don't care for, she explained. It brings down the dirt. When the boy brought them a grand piano, Homily begged Pod to build a drawing room next to the sitting room, she said, and we could move the storerooms farther down, then we could have those gilt chairs he talks about and the palm in a pot. Pod, however, was a little tired of furniture removing. He was looking forward to the quiet evenings when he could doze at last beside the fire in his new red velvet chair. No sooner had he put a chest of drawers in one place when Homily, coming in and out of the door to get the effect, made him try it somewhere else. And every evening at about his usual bedtime, the roof would fly up and more stuff would arrive. But Homily was tireless, bright-eyed and pink-cheeked. After a long day's pushing and pulling, she still would leave nothing until morning. Let's just try it, she would beg, lifting up one end of a large doll's sideboard so that Pod would have to lift the other. It won't take a minute. But as Pod well knew, in actual fact, it would be several hours before, disheveled and aching, they finally dropped into bed. Even then, Homily would sometimes hop out to have one last look. In the meantime, in payment for these riches, Arietti would read to the boy. Every afternoon in the long grass beyond the cherry tree, she would lie on his back, he would lie on his back, and she would stand beside his shoulder and tell him when to turn the page. They were happy days to look back on afterward, with the blue sky beyond the cherry boughs, the grasses softly stirring, and the boy's great ear listening beside her. She grew to know that ear quite well, with its curves and shadows and sunlit pinks and golds. Sometimes, as she grew bolder, she would lean against his shoulder. He was very still while she read to him, and always grateful. What worlds they would explore together! Strange worlds to Arietti. She learned a lot, and some of the things she learned were hard to accept. She was made to realize once and for all that this earth on which they lived turning about in space did not revolve, as she had believed for the sake of little people, nor for big people either, she reminded the boy when she saw his secret smile. In the cool of the evening, Pod would come for her, a rather weary Pod, disheveled and dusty, to take her back for tea. And at home there would be an excited homily and fresh delights to discover, Shut your eyes, Homily would cry. Now open them, and Arietti, in a dream of joy, would see her home transformed. All kinds of surprises there were. Even one day, lace curtains at the grating looped up with pink string. Their only sadness was that there was no one there to see. No visitors, no casual droppers in, no admiring cries and envying glances. What would homily have not given? What homily? What would homily have not given for an overmantel or a harpsichord, or even a rain barrel? Would have been better than no one at all. You write to your uncle Hendreary, homily suggested, and tell him a nice long letter, mind, and don't leave anything out. 
Ariadne began the letter on the back of one of the discarded pieces of blotting paper, but it became, as she wrote it, just a dull list, far too long, like a sale catalog or the inventory of a house to let. She would have she would have to keep jumping up to count spoons or to look up words in the dictionary, and after a while she laid it aside. There was so much else to do, so many new books to read, and so much now that she could talk of with the boy. He's been ill, she told her mother and father. He's been here for the quiet and the country air, but soon he'll go back to India. Did you know, she asked the amazed homily, that the Arctic night lasts six months and that the distance between the two poles is less than that between the two extremities of a diameter drawn through the equator? Yes, they were happy days, and all would have been well, as Pod said afterward, if they had stuck to borrowing from the doll's house. No one in the human household seemed to remember it was there, and consequently, nothing was missed. The drawing room, however, could not help but be a temptation. It was so seldom used nowadays. There were so many knick-knack tables which had been out of Pod's reach, and the boy, of course, could turn the key in the glass doors of the cabinet. The silver violin, he brought them first, and then the silver harp. It stood no higher than Pod's shoulder, and Pod restrung it with horsehair from the sofa in the morning room. A musical conversione. That's what we would have, we could have, cried the exulting homily as Arietti struck a tiny, tuneless note on a horsehair string. If only, she went on fervently, clasping her hands, your father would start on the drawing room. She curled her hair nearly every evening nowadays, and since the house was more or less straight, she would occasionally change for dinner into a satin dress. It hung like a sack, but homily called it Grecian. We could use your painted ceiling, she explained to Arietti, and there are quite enough of those toy builder's bricks to make a parquet floor. Parquet, she would say. Parquet, just like a harpsichord. Even great aunt Sophie, right away upstairs in the littered grandeur of her bedroom, seemed distantly affected by a spirit of endeavor, which seemed to flow in gleeful whirls and eddies about the stained old house. Several times lately, Pop, when he went into her room, had found her out of bed. He went there nowadays not to borrow, but to rest. The room, one might almost say, had become his club, a place to which he could go to get away from things. Pod was a little irked by his riches. He had never visualized, not in his wildest dreams, borrowing such as this. Homily, he felt, should call a halt. Surely now their home was grand enough. These jeweled snuff boxes and diamond encrusted miniatures, these filigree vanity cases and Dresden figurines, all as he knew from the drawing room cabinet, were not really necessary. What was the good of a shepherdess nearly as tall as Arietti or an outsized candle stuffer? So, sounds like homily keeps wanting more and more and more. What does this situation make you think of? Share with your fellow listeners. And now a few moments more of the borrowers for today. Sitting just inside the fender where he could warm his hands at the fire, he watched Aunt Sophie hobble slowly around the room on her two sticks. She'll be downstairs soon, I shouldn't wonder, he thought bluntly, hardly listening to her oft-told tale about a royal luncheon aboard a Russian yacht. Then she'll miss these things. It was not Aunt Sophie, however, who missed them first. It was Mrs. Driver. Mrs. Driver had never forgotten the trouble over Rosa Pickcatchet. It had not been, at the time, easy to pinpoint the guilt. Even Crampfer had felt under suspicion. From now on, Mrs. Driver had said, I'll manage on me own. No more strange maids in this house. Not if I'm to stay on myself. A 
drop of Madeira here, a pair of old stockings there, a handkerchief or so, an odd vest, or an occasional pair of gloves. These, Mrs. Driver felt, were different. These were within her rights. But trinkets out of the drawing room cabinet, that, she told herself grimly, staring at the depleted shelves, was a different story altogether. She felt tricked. Standing there on that fateful day in the spring sunshine, feather duster in hand, her little black eyes had become slits of anger and cunning. It was, she calculated, as though someone suspecting her dishonesty were trying to catch her out. But who could it be? Cramfurl? That boy? The man who came to wind the clocks? These things had disappeared gradually, one by one. Someone of that, she felt sure, who knew the house. And someone who wished her ill. Could it, she wondered suddenly, be the old lady herself? The old girl had been out of bed lately and walking about her room. Might she not have come downstairs in the night, poking about with her stick, snooping and spying? Mrs. Driver remembered suddenly the empty Madeira bottle and two glasses which so often were left on the kitchen table. Ah, thought Mrs. Driver, was this not the sort of thing she might do, the sort of thing she would cackle over back upstairs again among her pillows, watching and waiting for Mrs. Driver to report the loss? Everything all right downstairs, Driver? That's what she'd always said, and she would look at Mrs. Driver sideways out of those wicked old eyes of hers. I wouldn't put it past her, Mrs. Driver exclaimed aloud, gripping her feather duster as though it were a club. And a nice Mary Andrew she'd look if I caught her at it, creeping about the downstairs rooms in the middle of the night. All right, my lady, she muttered Mrs. Driver, muttered Mrs. Driver grimly. Cry and potter all you want. Two can play at that game. Sounds like Mrs. Driver is getting suspicious about all these things that are disappearing. Sounds like it could lead to trouble as the borrowers continues.